we're pleased today to have uh, Nicole Hughes present to us. And she, Nicole is with uh, Renewable Northwest. Uh, she's been there for about five years with Renewable Northwest and worked in renewable energy and different phases of renewable energy, uh, I think for about 20 years. And she's worked for BPA, some consulting firms, and uh, uh, was, so, and has been focused, uh, Nicole, correct me if I'm wrong here, but a lot of the focus has been on, on utility scale wind and solar. And today she's going, okay. Today she's going to tell us about Renewable Northwest activities, uh, what they're doing to reduce greenhouse gases. And uh, she's gonna talk a little bit about active legislation and regulations and uh, the markets and uh, helping, uh, I don't know, helping the transmission grid get it to more to decarbonize the transmission grid. So Nicole, with that, I'll turn it over to you. Thanks. And I will share my screen and get the slide deck up and running. Okay. Can you see my screen? Yes. Okay, great. So I, I have a very, very basic slide deck about who we are and what we do, but happy to just have this be uh, ongoing a conversation and happy to, to answer any questions along the way. Um, so thank you so much for having me. I'm Nicole Hughes, the Executive Director of Renewable Northwest. And as Mike mentioned, I, um, I did work in uh, utilities and doing consulting and worked as an energy developer for about eight years. Did a little work in finance before I took this job in the nonprofit sector, and I'm really enjoying it. I've uh, great staff and great members that I want to tell you all about. Um, but first, I'll just tell you about the organization. So we've been around for about 28 years, um, and the the region we work in is the Pacific Northwest proper, or for us energy nerds, the BPA footprint. So that encompasses Oregon, Washington, Idaho, and Montana. I always throw California in there because you can't really do energy market work in the Northwest without interacting in California. And I'm active on a couple of boards in, in California as well. So we think it's an important to state to be considering. Um, so the work we do is in three areas. We do planning, policy, and markets and transmission work. And so I will walk through with you what that all means here in a minute. But uh, first wanted to tell you about my staff. So we have um, staff located all over the Northwest. Uh, a handful of us are here in Portland, Oregon. Um, my deputy director, Max Green, is an attorney uh, by training and does oversees all of our policy and regulatory work. Um, Robin Arnold is our markets and transmission director and she's in Montana. Diane's our Oregon State Director. She's in Corvallis. Sashwat oversees all of our technology and you know technical uh, work here in Portland. Pam keeps us all afloat. <laughs> She's our operations manager. Kate is in Seattle and she is our Washington policy manager. And then Emily is our strategic outreach manager. She does a lot of work building relationships with um, local governments and tribes and, and rural communities. Uh, we are hiring, and I'll tell you a little bit about that because it's it's something that I could use some help with. Um, we had planned on hiring another technical staff person um, and have an active job announcement out. We haven't been getting a lot of really good responses. And then Sashwat um, announced that he's going to be leaving us at the end of April. His wife is expecting, and they're going to be moving back to India to be with family. And so we're going to need to be filling two technical positions. We're looking for recent grads from engineering schools and possibly people with policy experience. Um, what we're interested in is people who have had experience working with utilities, understand concepts like resource adequacy and the capacity accreditation process for renewable generators and transmission. So I'm just going to put a plug out there. We we are going to be putting out a new job announcement soon to sort of backfill Sashwat's position. I'll probably share that with you, Mike, if that's okay. You could share it around your network. Thanks. Um, and then my board is quite a diverse board. We 
the organization is unique in terms of nonprofit organizations that do this kind of work and that we're sort of 50% of our funding comes from um, the renewable energy industry. So that includes everything from developers to manufacturers, buyers of clean energy, um, rec traders and marketers, environmental consultants and law firms, universities. And then the other half of our funding comes from foundations. And our board is made up of 50% or one more nonprofit representative than for-profit to help balance out that. And um, so it makes for a very dynamic um, membership. <laughs> we often don't have consensus on all the issues, but I think in the end, this sort of for-profit nonprofit model does a really good job of um, advocating for clean energy industry, but doing so in a way that's consistent with the policies that uh, we believe are important to be in place here in our region. So um, I have members of my board that are both represented of the renewable energy industry, as well as other nonprofits in the region. And here's just kind of a, a spattering of examples of our members, the renewable energy industry and the supporting organizations are organizations that pay dues and nonprofit organizations um, are reciprocal members. They don't pay dues, but everybody has the same access to our membership benefits. So let's talk a little bit about the work. Um, I mentioned the three work areas. Uh, one of those being policy. So we have policy staff in Montana, Washington, and Idaho, and have contract lobbyists in those three states. We do not have staff in Idaho yet, but we are considering um, doing that. Wait, did I say? So Montana, Washington, Oregon, and we don't have staff in Idaho yet, but we're considering moving in that direction at some point soon. So the kinds of policies that we work on um, Traditionally, were like the renewable portfolio standards, which required utilities to get a certain amount of their energy from renewable generators. Those policies were really great at sort of spurring the local renewable energy industry. Uh, but now we are we have set our, our sights higher, and we have set our sights on 100% clean energy standards. So um, we've worked to pass these pieces of legislation in both Oregon and Washington so far, and had success. Other policy things we work on is land use. So land use is uh, an important piece of the puzzle for renewable energy development. It's very difficult to get renewable energy generation projects and the much needed transmission cited and built in the region. And so we don't work on project specific land use issues, but we do advocate for state and county level permitting processes that are transparent and predictable and um, maintain that balance of environmental protection and community interests, and then also help us move forward with installing new renewable energy generation. Other issues we tend to deal with in the policy realm is tax treatment. So we advocate for tax abatements and tax credits. Um, types of abatements that we've worked on include property tax abatements, where instead of paying a, a, a fee, every uh, a certain percentage of the value of the project, you pay like a flat fee over the life of the project. It's beneficial for the local community because they have a, a anticipated amount of revenue that comes off these projects and it's better for the developer because it's a flat amount and it doesn't depreciate quickly over the life of the project. Um, we do a lot of study bills around new technologies. Uh, we've done one around regional markets in Oregon and on offshore wind and you know when we have new technologies or new issues that we want to expose to a legislature we'll pull, we'll push in a study bill we also help agencies get the support that they need so department of energy and other agencies like in washington department of commerce that that they need to help um, move the policies around energy forward in those states Another, so, so kind of the area that we're probably most well known is in the regulatory work that we do. So um, all of the investor owned utilities in the region are regulated by the utility commissions. 
And that's the location where they come to get approval for their plans for how they're going to meet the energy needs of the region. And so we work on utility planning and procurement and rates and rulemaking and implementation of uh, clean energy plans, all with an eye of making sure that renewable energy generation is being valued correctly and that, um, that there's a transparent and fair process in the procurement process and that we're assigning the right capacity accreditations to the generators and, and such and so forth. I wanna pause and just um, mention something, Michael, you, you had mentioned at the beginning, you asked the question about, do we work on just utility scales? Yeah, so this is a, an important distinction. Um, we, we occupy what we call the big grid area. Uh, anything sort of from the, um, you know, distribution system to the customer isn't really what we work on. So we do, we don't work on any behind the meter policies or net metering or demand side stuff. We do advocate for those things because we think that they're an important part of balancing what we call the big grid. But most of the policies that we work on are, you know, utility scale and transmission. Um, a lot of times when people find out I do this work, they ask me like, should I put solar panels on my roof? And I probably know as much as about that that anybody on the street does. So I'm definitely not a uh, you know, customer-sided um, expert. All right, so the third area um, that we work uh, is a vastly growing area. And this is in our markets and transmission work. So. What we're seeing in the, the energy realm is a lot of the focus used to be more on the state level, and we're starting to see a lot of this decision making being moved up to the regional level. And the region, reason is because it's been kind of widely accepted that in order for us to get to 100% decarbonized grid, we have to be more connected in the region. We have to be able to value the renewable energy generation where it generates. So we have to be able to, you know, get the high capacity wind from Montana and off of the coast and the high capacity solar from the desert Southwest and create a big regional grid in order to really decarbonize the system. So we do do a lot of advocating around regional markets. Um, if this is an area that you've been familiar in, we have been engaged in the California system independent system operators process to set up their day ahead market and our um, stakeholders in the Southwest Power Pools process to set up their day ahead market and have been heavily involved in the Western Power Pools, Western Resource Adequacy Program. And I can, I can answer questions about any of these things. But the view from our place on this issue is we have the opportunity now to create a new energy market that has um, that prioritizes clean energy, has good governance, which allows more voices at the table and prioritizes greenhouse gas accounting. Um, another area we work in this markets and transmission realm is, is trying to use our existing transmission system more efficiently. So we've done a few projects where we've identified existing capacity on transmission systems that hasn't been utilized and is basically just sitting empty based on existing some you know contract provisions or things like that and we've worked towards opening those up for more generation we push on utilities to uprate line ratings and to consider using grid enhancing technologies uh, we work with utilities on Q interconnection queue reform where you have a lot of projects that have just been backed up in the queue and you need to go through a process of cleaning them out and getting the projects ready to move forward quicker. And then finally, um, we all have heard that we're gonna need more transmission to fully decarbonize the electricity grid. And so where it's needed, we advocate for construction of new transmission, um, but we also think it's important to be taking a regional view of this so that we're creating new transmission that's gonna be useful in the future and not overbuilding. So that is just kind of an overview of the work that we do. That's the end of my, um, my uh, presentation. And um, 
I, and, and I'm open to questions. And then I just had a few comments for consideration for you all as you think about how to organize yourselves in this in this world. So I'll, I see there's, is there a question in the chat? You have some chat questions, yes. Can, can you read those? Uh, yes, Nicole? what about distribution lines in environmentally sensitive lands like sage grass habitat? What is the correct balance of energy grid and environment? And and they is co-locating facilities not considering it all the time. Um, yes, yeah, so um, we would love for the, there's several transmission lines out there that probably should be upgraded before we consider building new lines. So for example, the Bonneville Power Administration which owns about 80% of the transmission in the region, has identified a handful of critical upgrades that are needed to help bring new generation to load. And we're advocating for BPA to spend the money on those first before they try and build new transmission. So that's always, that's always the first thing, like can we use the existing lines better? Can we upgrade them before we build new transmission? But sometimes new transmission is needed. For any of you who have ever been through a transmission construction process, it is very daunting, takes many years and goes through extreme um, environmental analysis. We are part of a coalition of organizations in the Northwest and in the West writ large who are advocating for better ways of citing transmission. And so we do a lot of work with state agencies, wildlife advocates, equity organizations on coming up with those principles. Excuse me. We, we've heard stories, Nicole, of uh, kind of horror stories as far as we're concerned. Of utilities wanting to build a transmission line that's taken them 10 years or something, and for one reason or another, they still can't get it approved. Uh, yeah, and I think a lot of that also has to do, one of the reasons why we're advocating for this regional market is if you think about like when Portland General needs to build a new transmission line, they have to spread the cost of that transmission line over just the Portland general rate payers, and they have to get approval for that from the regulatory commission. But if you could imagine being a part of a large, a larger market where you have rate payers from several different states, and if there's a transmission line that's built that, that benefits the entire network, you can spread those costs over a lot more rate payers. And, and having a regional market also gives you better price signals of where transmission is needed. So instead of looking on a balancing area by balancing area basis, we're looking on a grid wide basis. Um, I'm going down the list here. Can you say more about overbuilding transmission? So that those kind of what I just said there is I think that utilities, IOUs love to build transmission because they get to rate base it themselves. But if we looked at like, what are the needs across three or four transmission or owners or three or four balancing areas? Like, let's say we have Puget Sound Energy is a great example. They have a very dire need for new transmission to meet their Clean Energy Transformation Act requirements. But if we partnered with BPA and maybe Snohomish PUD, could we get a transmission line that benefited all of them? And then instead of having each of those organizations build their own transmission line. Michael, good to see you. Good to hear from you. <laughs> According to NREL's Oregon's technical offshore wind resource potential is 62 gigawatts, which could provide more than four times the state's total electricity consumption. Although terawatts of capacity are waiting to be connected around the country, a PNNL study found Oregon could accommodate more than one gigawatts of offshore wind with its current transmission line. What more can be done to leverage these and other distinct advantages the state has to accelerate development? in this promising new industry in Oregon. So this is definitely a burgeoning subject. Um, we're very early in the stage of considering offshore wind in Oregon. And yes, transmission is one of the big constraints. Um, there are call areas that have been established by the Bureau of Ocean Energy Management, and soon those will be identified as wind and energy leasing areas. And then in summer of 2024, those will be put out for a lease auction. Since those original call areas were identified, a bunch of constraints have come up, which has shrunk the area. So the Department of Defense has identified a large area there that they say, you can't go there. We have national security interests. And there's also conflicts with shipping lanes and then potential conflicts with fishing. 
And so I think right now the industry and all the stakeholders are just having conversations about what is the best way to move forward? How do we, how do we make sure that all the stakeholders are engaged in the conversation? How do we make sure that all the right environmental analysis is done? And what we are really advocating for right now with the state is how do we make sure the state is involved in a way that ensures that the benefits of this new industry are experienced by all Oregonians? So, you know, what can we do for the, the sort of poverty restriction part, poverty restriction parts of the Oregon coast that have sort of been, you know, beholden to these resource extractive industries for a long time? And what can we do for the tribes? How can they be a part of that? And so we're kind of in that stage, having those initial conversations. We're also talking with the state of Washington and the state of California and how to make sure we have the, the workforce to do this because it takes quite a bit of people. Um, and we have a supply chain. So how can, we, how can we create more opportunities at our ports? And how do we, you know, where should the ports that do this kind of work be? And what other sort of secondary industries may pop up around the development of offshore wind that could be beneficial for our region? So that's kind of in a nutshell where we're at. I wish I had direct answers to tell you like, you know, the crystal ball of what it's all gonna look like, but lots of work more to do there. Do you think grid connected energy storage is being properly priced? <laughs> Great question, not everywhere. <laughs> um, Sashwat on our team is a, is a, is an expert in this. He, uh, did his, um, he's an engineer by training and did his a PhD in policy around storage resources. And he has done an amazing job in some, a couple States starting with Washington and then with, and now in Idaho with correcting the value assumption around storage. It has a lot to do with how you calculate it in and where, how it's interconnected in the process. So more work to be done there. Um, how does your organization work with, compete, and or collaborate with the Citizen Utility Board? Great question. Cub is a member of ours. Um, my Getz, who's an attorney with Cub, is on my board. And we collaborate very closely with Cub. We support them. They support us. And uh, it's a great partner to have. Um, on March 6, BPA received a large generator interconnection request for one gigawatt of offshore floating wind off the Southern Oregon coast. Yes, um, and unfortunately, BPA still thinks offshore wind is like a next decade thing. We're trying to get them prepared for the fact that it's probably coming a little sooner and that they need to be prepared. We're pushing BPA in a number of ways on transmission. They are um, a little conservative in how they and, and very risk averse and typically wait until an upgrade or a new transmission line is 100% fully subscribed before they make any investment in it. And they were given additional borrowing authority under the um, bipartisan infrastructure law. And we think they should be using that money on building new infrastructure. Um, they, like everyone, are suffering right now from uh, a lack of workforce and um, and competing with Department of Energy in Washington, D.C. on hiring. And so we're also supporting BPA right now in getting some legislation passed that allows them to hire outside of the civil service pay scale so that we can get some really good engineers on staff at BPA because we we know it's needed. They're, they're behind in doing their analyses and they're talking a lot about the challenges they're having with workforce. So they need that support going forward. And Adam says, yes. <laughs> um, these are all great yeah. questions. Anybody else? Yeah, I had, had another question. Uh, <clears throat> we've had, I, I personally had some experience in working with wind farm developers and in trying to get an interconnection with BPA and, and the line would be fully subscribed. And if the line is fully subscribed, that doesn't mean that it's uh, fully used. Uh, it could be way, way down as the average load on that line. And some subscribers, maybe it's only used if another if another transmission line parallel path is out and then bingo, the load goes up on this line. Is that is is that a point of discussion or is that pretty well settled that uh, if I have a transmission line here that's uh, loaded on the average to uh, 25% of his capacity, but there's 
certain cert contingencies that might load it up higher. Do, is that discussed? <laughs> yeah, I think, um, you know, BPA is, should be credited for a, basically massive investments in infrastructure, you know, up until about the early 90s. And they did an amazing job creating what we have today. And then there was a big lull and they've lost a lot of important knowledge base on how to build transmission. And they're building that back up. But like I said, they're, they're struggling with workforce issues. And I think they're also starting to evolve their way of thinking around how to study transmission. And right now they have a process that's ongoing that we're active in where they're looking at, at reforming their queue process on how they, what are the requirements for a generator getting into the queue and staying in the queue? Because unfortunately there are some developers that like to what we call queue squat where they sit in there and they use those queue positions as some like a financial transaction tool to try and do deals. And we don't think that's an appropriate use of the queue. We wanna see those projects being moved through the study process. And so I think there's a few things. There's a need to reform the queue. BPA is thinking differently about how they how they plan for transmission. And I think, you know, trying to get up to speed on some new technologies. There's lots of um, new, you know, grid enhancing technologies out there that could probably do a lot to increase the capacity on some of these lines without having to make major investments. So yes, active conversations. Let's see, I see a couple more questions. Do you know of any study looking into movable storage, which could be charged at the generator locations delivered to distribution substations? That way we can eliminate transmission lines. So we've written some papers on the use of storage as a transmission asset. Uh, we haven't um, talked about them in terms of like movable, um, you know, uh, movable pieces, but storage that's, installed at substations could be considered transmission asset. I do know the military uses storage on it that's movable. So um, it is something that people are thinking about. Um, would adding additional storage resources in the locations where the offshore wind would come on shore helping help get those new transmission lines fully subscribed? And if so, how do we get that funded? So that's interesting. Um, yeah, there are people who are saying like, well, if we're gonna have this massive generation off the Oregon coast, shouldn't we have something that's closer to the generation that can store energy? And so there's people thinking about hydrogen, there's people thinking about pumped storage and batteries. Um, you know, one of the things I always caution people with is that just because there's generation happening in a place doesn't mean that that generation is actually making it to the local <laughs> to the local load. So if we want that resiliency piece in this industry, we have to force that to happen. We have to make sure that there's support at the local level for upgrading the existing distribution system. It might not be directly connected to the offshore generators, um, but we have to kind of make that happen. And in terms of getting it funded, again, it's just a matter of, you know, we, we are sort of kind of advocating for the build it and they will come model right now, because we know that we need so much generation to meet our, you know, I think like 12 gigawatts is what the West needs for new, new generation to meet their, their um, needs. And so uh, if that's the case, we better start getting, getting going on transmission because it takes many years to build it. But then it's a question of how you get that funded. And so I think there are some opportunities with the bipartisan infrastructure. It's just a matter of who's going to take advantage of those. And in our region, like I said before, the federal PMA owns most of the transmission and those bills weren't written specifically for them. So that's something that we actually hired lobbyists in DC to help us work on. Should all large distribution line projects have EISs? That is what mostly slowing down grid expansion. So I'm assuming that means uh, you're referring to an environmental impact statement. Um, so we have been advocating for permitting reform at the, at the local level as well as the federal level. One of the things that we think could help would be for existing transmission lines that just need upgrades. And that could mean small widening of the existing right-of-ways 
could we do a categorical exclusion or some sort of a smaller environmental study there? Um, but I think for brand new projects, I wouldn't advocate for not having an environmental impact study done. I would advocate for there being more um, streamlining and who manages that instead of having like a federal process and a state process and a county process. Can we have a one-stop shop permitting process? Some have been advocating for FERC to play that role, but we also know that local communities don't tend to trust government and definitely not the federal government. So trying to find the right mix is definitely an active conversation. Can electric cars be grid storage? Yes, they can. I can't tell you how, because that's not my area of specialty, but I love the idea of that. <laughs> do you have any involvement in the clean hydrogen area? So we do have members who are developing hydrogen. I served on the Renewable Hydrogen Alliance board for five years. I no longer do that. Um, not because I don't believe it's a, it's a valid thing, but because I just have other priorities. So um, my invol our involvement is pretty minimal, but we have um, a set of principles and we're working on an update to those around how we think hydrogen should be treated in policy uh, arenas in our region. Nicole, I had, I had one question. Uh, how an organization like ours could work with, with your group or other groups to further the yeah. cause here. Any suggestions would be appreciated. I'm really glad you, you asked that because after the first time we met, I had a number of conversations and I think, so the, the organization that I'll kind of put up as what I think would be a good model for you guys to consider is the Union of Concerned Scientists. So they're a member of Renewable Northwest. They're an organization of scientists who came together and said, hey, we all are really concerned about climate change. So let's pull together a membership organization and get some staff and start getting foundation grants. So I um, have been going to and speaking at IEEE conferences and sort of pushing really hard on this concept of getting to know the engineers better and and like mixing engineers with policy wonks because that's an area where advocates like us tend to be really weak like we're good at advocating for clean energy but um there's a, not a lot of technical knowledge in the advocacy arena so we need more and um so i think there's opportunities to partner i would say you know my vision would be if you could get you know get a pitch together, get a, a list of names and organizations of people that are considered, you know, members or however you want to call them. And I could help make some introductions to some foundations to get you started. And then you'd move towards getting um, some staff. And then, um, you know, once you are a nonprofit organization, then you can join members, member organizations like Renewal Northwest, and you can have a seat at the table and you can learn and we can learn from each other. Um, but I do think there's an opportunity, there's quite an, a niche here that you guys could offer. Um, recently, I was awarded a grant from Google to do some technical capacity building amongst advocates in Oregon because there's a lot of people that have done really great work advocating for clean energy in Oregon, but none of them understand the complexities of BPA or regional markets or transmission. and so. You know, I think there's some technical capacity training that's needed in our region. I'll, I'll look forward to talking with you more about that. Do you know more about the ESS battery company? I do not know about that company. Any other questions uh, before uh, we let Nicole? Go here. Nicole, I want to thank you for your time. Uh, it's been very informative, and we look forward to uh, talking more with you about uh, reducing greenhouse gases and what, we, what our group can do. So yeah. thank you for your time. Yeah, thank you all for your time. Feel free to reach out if you have questions. I'll, I'll share the presentation. It has my contact info, and then... Mike, I think we should get a follow-up call and talk about, you know, your next steps. Great. Appreciate it. Thank you.
Thank you, everyone. Take care. Thanks, Nicole. Bye-bye. So